knows a lot about the science stuff, Professor Dave explains. In the previous tutorial, we discussed the hypothetical examples of catalytic amination and catalytic hydrogenation in order to introduce ourselves to the world of transition metal catalysis. We must now get a bit more practical in describing precisely how this is done in the laboratory, as our goal is to understand not just theoretical concepts, but also the practical aspects of how a chemist physically carries out these transformations, so that we can understand their industrial applications. The first thing we must know is that both of these reactions can be carried out using homogeneous catalysts. Homogeneous catalysts operate in solution using classical organic solvents, or in rare cases even water, but the key detail is that the catalyst is in the same phase as the reactants. In this tutorial, we will review some basics regarding homogeneous catalysis. Let's start by discussing catalytic cycles. The familiar way that we presented these two reactions as a series of discrete steps in a specific order is actually not how chemists represent this type of catalysis. It is more convenient to draw them in a cycle, as shown here. In this cycle, we start with an initial catalyst, C, facilitating the combination of reactants A and B, to yield a product, P. For the moment, we don't need to rigidly define the catalyst, but we note that it is usually a transition metal bound to a number of ligands, and the ligands play a major role in the ability of the catalyst to operate the cycle. More on this later. Now, to get more specific, the reaction of C with A yields intermediate AC, and the rate of this step is associated with a specific kinetic constant, K1. This will be followed by reaction of AC with B, forming ACB, which also has a specific kinetic constant, K2. Now that A and B have been brought together, they combine to yield P, and in the process they release the original catalyst C, which restarts the cycle, and this reaction has another kinetic constant, K3. Note the incoming and outgoing arrows account for molecules that are brought into the cycle and those which leave the cycle. Naturally, most catalytic cycles are more complex than this, but this basic framework gives you an idea of how we will represent the reactions we will be discussing in this series. Homogeneous catalysis is widely practiced in the synthesis of complex molecules, like fine chemicals and pharmaceuticals. As we mentioned, the catalyst M is usually bound to a number of ligands, and these ligands can be optimized to tailor specific reactivities of interest. In some cases, using chiral ligands, prochiral substrates can be reacted in high enantiomeric excess, and this allows for a small amount of chiral material, the ligand, which is present in only catalytic amounts, to be amplified into large amounts of high-value enantiomerically pure materials, which are of great industrial importance. Therefore, the success of homogeneous catalysis relies on the ability to modulate the reactivity of a metal center and achieve reactions of exquisite precision and selectivity. This is usually not possible with heterogeneous catalysts, as we will see in the next tutorial. There are, of course, numerous drawbacks to using homogeneous catalysts. For one, they tend to be very air-sensitive and difficult to handle. They often have to be prepared and stored under argon gas because of their extreme reactivity with oxygen, and they have to be handled using specialized inert techniques by experienced chemists. In the lab, this is not a major problem because of the availability of Schlenk technology, vacuum and argon lines, or glove boxes. But in large-scale industrial settings, inert atmosphere can be very costly as it requires sophisticated systems far beyond a simple argon line. Nevertheless, these catalysts are routinely used to prepare literal tons of fine chemicals and pharmaceuticals. Another problem with homogeneous catalysts is that they tend to decompose during their catalytic performance, so at the end of a reaction they can't always be fully recovered and reused. In such a case, if an expensive metal is involved, this is usually recovered from the mother liquor, meaning the solution that remains after the product has been filtered or extracted. It can then be recycled by specialized companies. We mentioned that catalysts are limited by their delicate constitution. They may be inactivated by solvents, impurities, air, moisture, or destroyed through loss of ligands. 
Therefore, the chemist endeavors to reduce or eliminate these unwanted processes. The number of cycles the catalyst can enact before decomposing is called turnover number, abbreviated as TON, and it is clear that chemists will always look for high TON catalysts, because these catalysts may contain precious metal like palladium, rhodium, ruthenium, or iridium, plus costly ligands, and they are very expensive. The ton depends on substrates and conditions, so a catalyst can have widely different ton in different reactions. In a high-value industry like the pharmaceutical industry, many catalysts have ton of 1,000 or even less. In the agricultural industry, a higher ton is achievable, such as 10,000. Another parameter of importance is the turnover frequency, or TOF, which is the number of cycles the catalyst can enact per unit time, let us say per second. Here, too, the chemist will try to find a high TOF catalyst, short of causing an explosion because the TOF is too high, of course. But this has a low likelihood of happening. The more common problem is that some catalysts turn over too slowly, so the search for the ideal catalyst is a very difficult undertaking. Factor in the high cost for the best catalysts, and we can see why chemists work for years or even decades before they find a practical, useful catalyst for a given transformation. The history of chemistry is full of cases where reactions were invented early, but it took a really long time before a practical, generally useful class of catalysts became available. Finally, we need to mention that in our simple catalytic cycle consisting of three steps, one is usually much slower than the others, and therefore the rate of the reaction will depend only on that particular slow step, which is called the rate determining step, or RDS. The intermediate preceding this step is called the catalyst resting state, because if you monitor the reaction, you will only see the catalyst in that form. For example, if in our cycle the RDS is the step from C to CA, any analytical monitoring of the catalytic cycle will only show the species C and none of the other catalytic intermediates. It is rather unusual to have two steps proceeding at similar rates, although in principle this is possible. This is important information. To improve a catalyst, it is imperative to focus on the RDS, because improving that step will improve both TON and TOF. This explains why chemists run kinetic experiments to see which is the RDS of a cycle. Once this step has been identified, the chemist can manipulate the ligands or reagents to improve it. But the field of catalytic reaction kinetics is quite specialized and we will not delve into this topic in any detail. Homogeneous catalysis is a relatively modern discipline. Before this sophisticated chemistry was introduced, all transition metal catalysis was carried out on metal surfaces, and much of it still is today. Let's move forward and examine the basic principles of heterogeneous catalysis. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.